I watched v- Bad Vegan and was I couldn't stop watching it, and I wanted to stop and I couldn't. Uh, it was uh, like watching a nightmare where you just wanted this poor woman to get out and she wouldn't. Sarma Mangalis um, is is our guest, and um, I, I'm I'm so uh, happy that she gets to tell her story. Uh, you won't believe what happened to her. Um, I, I I think that w- this documentary Bad Vegan blew up on Netflix because here's this um, seemingly uh, self empowered, um, insightful chef that's navigating the vegan lane and has all these big shots gravitating towards her, and then she gets taken by this schlumpy guy who takes all of her money and it's so obvious what's happening and she can't see what's right in front of her face and it's fascinating and and here here's sarma in her own words the bad vegan this guy says we're pivot you understand just how we live it this for me is like rap religion open on beat because we got this guy when it comes to this y'all i can get it hype when it comes to this y'all calm has risen how you living huh yo how you living pivot Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good to see you. Nice to see you. Oh. Yeah, you get you get two for one. Leon's uh He was napping. Now he's awake. Leon. There's that's your best buddy. Yeah. How old is Leon now? Uh he is based on his estimated birthday, he is uh just over 12. That's a myth. So, I, I don't need my glass. I got him when he was about um, around five months old. So his birthday, I estimated, was around March um, of 2010. So, yeah, he's yeah, he's an old man, but he he looks like a puppy. That's because you or, you yeah, like do you do you spend like every moment with him? We have been together a lot more than usual these last couple of years too. So. Um, people always talk about their dogs having separation anxiety, but in my case, I'm the one that would get separation anxiety leaving, <laughs> leaving him. He's fine, but I get nervous if I have to leave him. He's such a lucky guy. I, I had a little French bulldog named Bubba and he passed away way too soon and my heart was broken. So I know I, I know how important it is to keep them close. Yeah, I know. That's the, I mean, that's the risk. Or not, it's not such, it's not even a risk. It's like a known thing when you get a dog or any kind of a, an animal that at some point your heart's going to get torn apart in all likelihood. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I I was introduced to you probably like everyone else, um, from your documentary, Bad Vegan, which was amazing and addictive as I'm sure you've heard from many people. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I was drawn to it innocently in the way that like, I have always been drawn towards raw food. It's always been very, uh, I, I found it so satiating for me. I just, I, I loved raw food and it's so mm-hmm. difficult to make it so that it tastes amazing. And so I knew about you from back in the day because of how well you could put it all together what a great chef you were. And, um, and then all this kind of unfolded. So I, and I, your, your background is extensive in terms of like, you put the hours in and you were this accomplished chef and, um, in, in a lane where, um, you know, it's, it's really so many people do it because of health, but then when you make it taste, incredible and it's on that gourmet level you were in kind of rarefied air wouldn't you say yeah yeah we i mean we tried to make it incredibly maximally inclusive um and you know whenever whenever people call me a chef i sort of feel funny because i don't feel like you know i wasn't the one making our food on a day-to-day basis and if i was complimented on our food specifically i was always quick to kind of punt that over to the people that were in the kitchen. So I think 
but weren't they your weren't, weren't they your recipes though and your oh, only like some in the very beginning and i did open with a with a partner in the beginning so um uh anyway i just i'm i, I try not to take credit mm. for for all of our food and whatnot because i feel like i was really good at um you know bringing in the right people and recognizing really talented people and cultivating an environment where they could thrive and um, almost being more of like a curator. So, um, you know, I feel like my role was almost more as a restaurateur versus a chef. Well, you're very humble and, <laughs> and um, a lot of, I, I mean, I, I remember it because I, I grew up macro psychotic, you know, because um, the macrobiotic uh, lifestyle can be a bit psychotic. Um, mm -hmm. And so I grew up um, in a theater family where we were incredibly unhealthy and then decided to get very healthy once my father had a heart attack, which usually happens in most families and, and certainly the people of that generation. So I was so appreciative of healthy food tasting amazing. Um mm -hmm. And and then, you know, things, as we all know, and I'm, I'm looking from the outside like everyone else, and um, you're, you're living the dream in New York, and you have this incredible partner slash husband, um, and then you guys kind of go your separate ways, and he's a superstar chef in that lane, and then you're doing it on your own. I'm just basically telling you your own story. This must be incredibly boring to you. <laughs> I, I'm kind of filling people in um, mm -hmm. uh, who, who don't kind of, you know, br bringing them up to speed a bit, if you will. Um, when when we're introduced to you um, on Bad Vegan, you met up with this guy. Should we call him Shane Fox? What should we call him? I know it's weird because I so I'm almost done with the book draft and throughout the whole thing I refer to him as Mr. Fox because uh -huh. only because I knew him one way early on and then later on found out his real name and um, Anthony you know, like, Anthony Strangis yeah that's his real name that's his real so, name and it's 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 one of those things it's like uh, I think they're called onomatopoeias when the word sounds like what it is because he indeed is strange right. And his name is Strangest. I mean, you know, I guess the clue is in the name, correct? Yeah. 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 It's kind of a, yeah, it's kind of a fitting name. Yeah. So you went from a fox to a strange. Exactly. Hmm. Well, yeah, I don't know that he was ever a fox, but. Well, that's another question. It, it, it sounded like a cool name early on. I was like, Shane Fox, that's a pretty cool name. And so I kind of knew him in my head as, uh, you know, we sort of jokingly at first called each other Mr. and Mrs. Fox. And um, <laughs> I, I think he did a good, a good job at kind of reeling me in online before we ever met. So I'm always very, I always tell people to be very careful meeting anybody um, you know, in any sort of an online context before, you know, before you meet face to face, it's just sort of particularly dangerous. But um, so we sort of got to know each other that way online. I think the biggest question people have as they watch it and, and the reason why it's so fascinating is here you are this like hardworking, insightful, classy woman, you know, and um, who you never think would fall for something like this and yeah and 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 yet it happened um and you even admit from the jump when you met him you know he wasn't who he even visually professed to be right early on yeah uh or when i first met him and then uh i think after that first time that we met in person i thought in my head like well yeah i, I don't think i'll be I'll probably won't be seeing him again, but, um, you know, but then I did and he sort of kept, you know, the, it took a long time. You know, he, I kept sort of pushing him out of my life and then he'd find his way back in and then I'd push him out and he'd find his way back in. So, um, you know, I think I'm not, I've historically not been great with boundaries and right. that made it easier for him to keep coming back in. Yeah. And he, 
it was revealed um, in the documentary that he had a history of this. So. Right. Yeah, that was all that was pretty much, you know, stuff that I found out, of course, after the fact. And um, yeah, about his his former wife, Stacy. And yeah. And and obviously he was uh, well versed in how to navigate manipulating someone by the time that you guys met. Yeah, I think certain people with a, with a certain psychology are naturally really good at that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I will never, I don't know the extent to which he may have also studied it, but I think certain types of people are, are naturally very, 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 very good at manipulating other people. And then I think there are some people who are more... Um, more prone to be manipulated and i'm i'm obviously one of those people um why do you think that is is um i mean it's all stuff i've had to kind of really look into and figure out myself after the fact and um yeah i think it's a combination of a lot of things i think some of it is um you know some of it is sort of a basic lack of self-confidence and and putting up boundaries i think um some of it um i've read about things like um, being an empath. You know, if, if you Google being an empath, it says like 15 signs you're an empath. And I check all those boxes. But one of the things about being somebody like that is that you're more able to be manipulated in some way. Um, and a really completely out of left field thing I wasn't expecting after this film came out is I got a ton of people coming at me telling me that I'm definitely on the spectrum. And I was, I thought nobody's, <laughs> nobody's ever said that to me in my life. Um, not, I don't mind at all. I actually kind of find it flattering, but that also was associated with being more, um, you know, I'm trying to think like able to be manipulated. And I think in part, it might have to do with, um, there's something about like you can't even believe that somebody would be so horrible. So you you would rather, you know, so like you'll believe their story versus thinking that they're really that much of a monster. So. Um, but, yeah, this is there's been a lot of uh, I've done a lot of reading and trying to figure out what happened, why it happened. Um, and it's most similar to being in a cult, I think that's what I've realized. And I realized relatively quickly, but so I relate a lot to people who've been in cults because it's this similar type of a process that happens. It's just that for me, it was a sort of a one-on-one situation. So let's go back a second. You said that you met him and you immediately thought, Oh, I, I won't be seeing this guy again. So it's kind of fascinating as, as a man hearing this, you, you weren't attracted to him in that way. And then he found a way, you said he kept getting back in and kept getting back in. Um, and you're saying it emanates from what you think is your own insecurity. Some of it, yeah, in part. Um, and how, how, and I, forgive me, I, I, I'm, because I'm just fascinated by this. And I think everyone's fascinated by it because they see you and they think you're great and you, you should be self-empowered and you should be living your best life. And you were brought to your knees by this guy and, you, and it was like watching this train wreck unfold that you couldn't believe was happening. Um, you know, and there, there are probably New Yorkers that say, you know, what about... You know, dudes that get taken advantage of by women, that doesn't happen. Oh, wait, that happens every eight seconds, you know, so Uh it's like a a gender specific thing. But I guess because you weren't attracted to this guy and there was nothing there for him to then flip it on you and, and have you be manipulated to the point where, you know, you were you were giving him all of the money that you were earning, essentially. Yeah. And then some, yeah. Um, yeah. 
I mean, it, it's, you know, I was attracted to him early on because he sort of presented himself. And this is what people like him are able to do is they're able to very quickly, you know, look at somebody and figure out what that person what their insecurities are, what they want, what they need, what they didn't get, you know, what they need deep down that they don't even know that they need, kind of. So they present themselves in a way that is, I guess, becomes hard to resist. So, And, and, um, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, some of those ways were that he would protect you and he was a guy who was you know, kind of former military, CIA, special ops, and that he can really protect you. Yeah, kind of. And the, just the ways that he would sort of praise me and, um, you know, talk about my accomplishments and um, just, yeah, I mean, all, all kinds of things that he would have picked up on. And also, I'm sure he read um, everything that was out there about me. And I had written some very personal blogs and things because I'm pretty open about everything. And so um, not only would he have been able to gather that information from me directly, but also reading it online. So sort of knowing like what my frustrations are, what my hopes and dreams are, and and therefore, you know, what I want out of life or from another person. And so he was kind of able to um, do whatever he does, you know, say the right things to, to pull me in. And then, right. um, and then Leon. Yeah. He, yeah. he, cause he knew how tied you were to Leon. And then he led you to believe that he found a way so that you would never have to feel pain towards Leon because he could live forever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that part of it was really overblown. I mean, there was a lot, I'm very, you know, I've written a lot about what I found, um, objectionable about the film, which I don't call it a documentary. I, I call it a film because it's, I feel like a documentary should be based on, uh, you know, should be incorporating journalistic integrity and the, the film didn't. So I, I, don't call it a documentary, but um, watching your story um, unfold, I, what I thought was great was that, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you really were and, and were given the time to express yourself. Um, this wasn't a one sided hashtag believe all anything. This was a please tell us your story. What happened? And so I, I think that we were all drawn into you and were we wanted to fight for you and we felt for you. Um, and and uh, so to me, I know you say it wasn't a documentary, but there was something very real and raw and honest about your depiction of what happened. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly it was you know, it's me there speaking my own words. I mean, I did, I did, I must've done, there must be at least 12 hours of my giving interview. So it was, you know, I had nothing to do with the editing. So for example, a lot of people's response was um, either kind of yelling at me directly online or, or commenting about me that, you know, she showed no remorse and she didn't apologize. You didn't apologize to your employees as if I, edited the, the film and put it, you know, presented it myself. I didn't, I gave, uh, these very, very long, you know, awkward interviews relatively early on. And, um, you know, I'm sure in there at some point I talked about how I felt about that issue and, you know, it, it wasn't included. And I'm not saying that that was, um, you know, deliberate, but anyway, you know how it is. It's like you give a really long interview and then, certain parts of it are presented, certain parts are not. Um, and in this case, certain parts were like spliced to give incorrect, you know, impressions about certain things, which, um, you know, which was to my detriment. So that was a bit, a bit frustrating. What do you think is the biggest misconception? Um, well, the most glaring one was that that phone call at the end is what people kind of freaked out about. Um, and, you know, and that was just weird and 
weird and upsetting that 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 clip of the phone call was put at the end because I was deliberately recording him, you know, specifically to try to get him on um, tape. I feel like when you say tape, that makes you old because it's not tape. Any- anyway, um, uh, you know, to get him recorded saying things that he used to say and whatnot. And I think that, you know, it's like people have a hard time understanding that I've come to realize that, you know, he's a person that me yelling at him about what he did is not going, you know, he, it's, it's, he's one of those people that like doesn't have a conscience. Right. So my having made a decision a while back to allow contact with him was strategic for many reasons. One was my, my safety, Leon's safety. And then later on, I was, I was talking to him for the purposes of getting him, uh, getting that audio recorded for the film. And I had no qualms about doing it. I think I said this in the very opening of the film, that I would never, like, I would never record somebody without their knowledge. And I would, I wouldn't do that to somebody except, um, you know, I think what I said was that motherfucker, fuck him. <laughs> so, you know, based on what he did to me, for me, recording him was was just a little bit of a, a little way to get back at him. So when I'm on, when I'm talking to him and they put that bit in the end where, you know, I'm I'm depicted as laughing with him or joking around with him. I mean, that's me pretending I'm sort of playing a role. And for them to have put that clip at the very end after um, showing a couple of people saying certain things. It was sort of deliberately, um, you know, it, it was done in a way that to, to deliberately create doubt or have people all of a sudden wonder, you know, was she in on it, which doesn't make any sense at all. Like in on what destroying my own life and hurting people I care about for what, for no benefit. Um, but a surprising number of people came to the conclusion that, you know, I was in on something and I should be behind bars. And um, yeah, that was that's a pretty common response. And for those people that say that or, you know, to the people that felt like you were insensitive or um, not empathetic towards them not getting paid, what what would you say to them? Um, well, I mean, that I am and that that film isn't a complete representation of who I am or how I feel. Um, I was sort of, it just so happened that I did a, I did one podcast before I had even seen the film. And in that podcast, I actually talk about how, um, you know, how it felt owing my employees money in particular, um, and kind of all of the shame associated with that. And, um, and then I also talk about, you know, how they were they were paid. So I, I agreed to do the the film and all of my employees were paid as a result of that. And I didn't profit at all beyond that. Like and so that that was another thing I thought was going to be at the end of the film. And that wasn't there. So, um, you know, there was a some people thought that I walked away somehow profiting from this. And, you know, as somebody in the industry, you would know that documentaries don't typically pay people so that it wouldn't have made sense that I would anyway. Um, but in this case, in order to, to participate in the first place, um, I wanted what my employees were owed to be paid. So that was arranged very early on um, in the process. So my employees were paid um, and that finally went through in March of 20, I think 2020, it was, it was wow. when the pandemic first started and then it happened, it happened that the whole wire transfer went from like one lawyer to their lawyer the day that, um, uh, New York restaurants were shut, shut down. So it was sort of a, um, you know, that happened on that day was kind of, um, meaningful. So Anthony slash Shane, um, at what point, because you, you admitted that you didn't want to believe that he was as bad as he is. Mm-hmm. And so you kept um, trying to convince yourself. Uh, and and it's very kind of Shakespearean. It's like uh, you you... 
you lived in fear of, I mean, you, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, you, yeah. you, you just kept going deeper and deeper and you felt like yeah. tur- turning back at, at a certain point would be worse than going forward. Or you, you tell me. It's kind of, is everything almost. I, sorry. Say, you say, sorry. Say that one more time. We just had a little bad connection. No worries. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, fear is a huge part of it. So keeping you in a state of fear and, and then also just keep not only keeping you in a state of fear, but keeping you in a state of fear and then also keeping you very kind of occupied and tired and overwhelmed so that you're not really able to stop and um, kind of contemplate what's going on. And all of that combined makes it difficult to look at things objectively and um um yeah and i and i think you know it's not i always like all the weird things that he told me it wasn't it wasn't that i believed him about a lot of these things it was just that i also didn't not believe him or he would assert things that you can't disprove you know it's like somebody people talk about i don't know god or the afterlife but you can't disprove that And so when he would present things, very often it would be things that you can't really disprove. So I think it was almost as if I always had one foot in his reality and one foot in real reality. And um, um, and yeah, I mean, it just it he sort of drove the process. Um, And I I think. No, go ahead. Sorry. (laughs) Oh, I mean, just slowing down is something that now I under I appreciate, you know, like if I was going to talk to people about how to not, how to, how to, what to do to prevent this type of a thing from happening. Um, a, a big part of it is, you know, having as much self-awareness as possible, but also, um, you know, stepping back and having that sort of quiet time, um, and, and being able to reflect on things. And um, that's something that I've now had a lot of time for. And, you know, I, sometimes I worry about, you know, whatever I'm going to do next and then getting back into this lifestyle where I'm super busy and I don't have time to, you know, do my morning pages or, um, you know, I know meditation is important to you. And I, it's something I try to do as well. And I find that it's incredibly helpful and probably also is a good, um, like a buffer or, or just helpful in, in being able to stay true to yourself versus allowing somebody else to take control of your psyche. When you say you try to meditate, um, what does that mean? Because <laughs> it's without, I mean... Can you be honest about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, I, it, there's, there's guided meditations, which I find helpful. Um, um, I, I don't, I try to do it as much as I can and I've gotten better and better at it. And I think one of the things that helped me enormously was just a very small thing that, uh, I think it was Dan Harris who said it, that every time your mind drifts and then you go, oh, shit, I'm thinking about other, you know, I'm thinking about what I want to eat for lunch. And then you think of that and then you go, well, no, I, I should not think about that and get back to meditation. That That's like doing a bicep curl so that all the, you know, the people who say like, oh, I try to medicate, meditate, but I can't because I keep thinking about other things. So when he's, when he explained that every time you sort of think of other things and then notice yourself thinking of other things and come back to it, that's like, sort of doing a, yeah, he said it was like doing a bicep curl. Um, and so it, it's, it's practicing being, it's helping you to practice being more aware of your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm not qualified to have this conversation, but I'm going to have it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, what it, what it sounds like when you were dealing with him is he, he kept you in this state of anxiety and you were sleep mm-hmm. deprived and, uh, he was manipulating you and you were kind of a slave to your doubts and thoughts and fears. And he kind of kept all those plates spinning with you and manipulated the hell out of you, took all your money 
And um, one of the great things that, as, as you just said, meditation does is help you to go inward and be as present as possible so you're not susceptible to those. Mm -hmm. You know, because that, that little bicep curl that you were talking about, that's everyday life of everyone, every human being, you know, because that's, we, we, we all, we have these antennas and sometimes these thoughts aren't even our own. They could be some racist freak down the street that puts some thought in your head. You go, oh, that's not right for me. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, good to see you. Thank you for your service. Uh, I don't need you in any way, whatever. And they, they pass by you and you don't even take the time to acknowledge or see it. They just, you just, it just kind of dissipates. But, um, did you, and forgive me, but it feels like you were not meditating in any way, shape or form during this process with him. Oh no, no, definitely not. And, and I, I don't even think before that I had, I had tried, but no, I, I definitely was not. Um, I definitely was not. And then, I mean, later on when it got really bad, it was, I kind of deliberately did everything I could to occupy my brain and not stop to think, you know, when it got to the kind of, to the point of no return, um, you know, I would deliberately occupy my, my brain. So, you know, the year when, or it was almost a year, I think it was about nine months. Everybody uh, refers to it as, you know, you were on the run. She was on the lamb with him. It's like, I didn't run away with him. I didn't want to leave. I was screaming my head off in the car when I realized that's what was happening when he was taking me away. And, um, and then that, I think it was about nine months, you know, which ended in Tennessee is like a, feels like a strange dream almost. And during that time, I occupied my brain as much as possible. So I was constantly watching. I think that's when I, I think that's when I was watching Mr. Selfridge, but I, I was, I constantly, I watched a ton of stuff on Netflix. Right. So I watched um, like the entire West wing. I watched, um, I, know, I, I watched all of Mad Men. I watched so much stuff. On um, and, I, and and then when I wasn't watching stuff like that, I had the TV on twenty four seven. I think I slept with the TV on a lot of the time. I watched the entire eleven hour of Benghazi hearing, which was you know <laughs> fascinating TV. Um, you could quiz me on politics, and I would know a lot in particular around that time. I was always playing sort of like little video, you know, like little iPad games and whatnot. So I was, I think, I was intentionally keeping my mind occupied because to to stop and think would have been you know terrifying in some way or in a lot of ways um so and again i've had to kind of figure a lot of this out after the fact you yeah. know i've tried to do a lot of reading and understanding like what is you know what's dissociation when i read about dissociation yeah that makes perfect sense um and also helps me understand why there's so much that I don't remember. Uh, that was something else that people responded to in the, regarding the film was that I think there were, I mean, I only, I watched it once and I haven't gone back to watch it and I keep like, I need to go back and watch it again, but I, I haven't in a while. Um, um, were you but, surprised at, at, at how popular it's become? Um, yeah, that was pretty surreal. And I, and I definitely was not prepared for it logistically or otherwise. Um, you know, I, I knew there'd be to some extent like a fire hose coming at me of, of incoming, but I was not prepared for just how high that would be turned on. Um, and I mean, yeah, I'm still not prepared for it. I mean, even now people, you know, somebody else who asked me to be on their podcast was like, well, you know, who on your team should we reach out to? And I'm like, my team, let's, there's <laughs> Leon. my team. You know, I, I just don't have like, yeah, I tried to you know, call Leon and, I, and he didn't wouldn't return my emails and it was brutal. <laughs> right. Yeah. Leon's gone so <laughs> Hollywood. It's, it's awkward. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, I, um, I don't know if I could say this. I used to be friends with this guy, uh, Bill block. Cause I, so I used to work at, um, they've skipped this weirdly too, but I, I used to work in finance and I worked at Bain capital for a while. And we, um, while I was there, um, acquired what became artisan entertainment. So I worked on that. And, um, um, I just remember interacting with Bill 
and he had not only did he have an assistant, but his assistant had an assistant, Mm. (laughs) which I mean, I just thought that was interesting. But uh, yeah, so I, I. I don't have an assistant or my assistant doesn't have an assistant. Leon doesn't have an assistant. Um, So I've just been kind of unprepared for uh, all of this incoming. And then furthermore, unprepared for um, kind of having to be on defense and, and trying to correct the record. So I, I quickly uh, sort of quickly, I put out, I, I put out stuff on my website, just kind of writing things and trying to, clarify what really happened um and then went through this went through this period of time where i was being advised to you know go to this news outlet or that news outlet and i sort of was like "Mm, i don't know about that and then ultimately just said fuck it and wrote this really long uh kind of an essay and put that online and then i was like all right i'm done you know now i'm just gonna go focus on finishing my book and my other work and moving on from here and people can think what they want to think, but at least it's, it's there. So somebody can go look online and see what I've written about it. Um, yeah. And from, and from there you were approached by this documentary. Is that correct? What do you mean? Uh, I'm just sure in terms of a timeline, when, when did the documentary, when did they come to you and say, we want to do this? Oh, um, it was 20, I think it must have been early 2019. Um, And was it after you wrote this? No, no, no. I wrote all this stuff very recently. So after it, after it was released, got it. You know, I I didn't, I I don't think I processed that people's response to the call at the end would be what it was. And the things that I knew were kind of incorrectly spliced together was like, well, that's annoying, but. Uh, and then people's response to it, I realized, oh, like, uh, holy shit, people came away with this completely incorrect conclusion about what happened. So, But you, was, you have to understand that that's the way everything is. And if you were to put something online that was uh, so had so much clarity and empathy and beauty and grace, there would be someone that has a problem with it. You understand that. And you and you're oh, also, yeah. and you're also a very I mean, I can just hear in, and, and unless I I'm getting it totally wrong. I feel like you're in your voice. You're still in some kind of pain. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's. um. Yeah, it, it would be different if it was if if I was the only one that had been hurt but a lot of other people were hurt in the process and it happened through me. And so I feel responsible. That's really difficult. You know, my mother was hurt. Um, That's incredibly difficult. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is very painful. I don't know if and when it ever won't be. I mean, hopefully if I'm able to, um, you know, I'm working on a few things, but, you know, I, my employees were all paid, but the rest of it, I'd like to make everybody kind of whole and not be, um, you, you know, so maybe after that, I'll, I'll feel, I'll be able to feel better about it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it still feels painful. Um, there's still things about it. I don't fully understand. Are you in, or have you ever been in therapy? I, so I have not had therapy via any specialists who understand this type of a thing. Um, so I've had to do a lot of that work on my own. Hmm. Um, yeah. Well, what, what is that syndrome called where you fall in love with your kidnapper? Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, from what I've read about that, it, it's not only, I mean, it, it may not necessarily be that you fall in love with them, but that there's like an attachment almost because they use this thing that, uh, I think sort of the administering and then deprivation of certain types of positive feedback, um, creates an attachment. So I certainly, um, 
grew to even, you know, I was, it's like, you can be simultaneously terrified of somebody and then also terrified that they'll leave you or, or, or attach to that person. Um, so I think in, in my case, because he was sort of the, the one directing everything, you know, I must have been attached in some way that, you know, if, if he, or attached to the idea that he was legit, because if he wasn't, then my life was fucked. And of course he wasn't, and my life was fucked, but, um, but you, you would rather cling to that idea that, that somehow he is legit or somehow he's going to take care of everything and it's all going to be okay. And it was hard to imagine. Um, I think also because, you know, if he had taken, if he had gotten all this money and put it somewhere and then hopped on a plane to Mexico, that would at least rationally make sense to people. Right. But he didn't, he sort of gambled it away and, you know, and then uh, everybody says, well, what were you doing in Tennessee when you're arrested? Like, what were you doing there? Why were you there? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. You know, why didn't he just leave you and go? Why didn't he just ditch you? I don't know. I don't, there's a lot of things I don't know the answer to. Um, so yeah, it's a, it is, is definitely a very bizarre story. And I think that I have that response that a lot of people do when they go through something is that you want it to be useful. So my coming out and talking about it, I hope, um, I think already has been at least useful in that there's a, I've gotten an enormous number of mostly women, some men too, giving me the feedback that they've been through something similar, right. uh, maybe not with such extreme consequences, but sometimes, you know, a lot of it resulting in incarceration because there's no understanding about this type of a thing. And so people feel isolated. Um, one that stood out to me was a woman who said she has a um, a PhD in clinical psychology and she was, you know, mind fucked in some way. And um, so again, there's a perception that if you're a reasonably intelligent person, that shouldn't happen to you, but it's kind of, that's not true at all. So that was what I think one of the variables as to why it was so fascinating watching you because anyone looking at it would go like, what, 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 what in God's name is she doing? How, how is she still in this? It's still happening. It was like you couldn't stop watching it. You know, it was this train wreck wrapped in a plane crash, um, wrapped in a, in a tsunami, and it just was a dumpster fire, and it just kept going, and uh, it it was it was just shocking. Um, what what do you think was the biggest hook that he used to kind of get you to continue to write checks? Um, I mean, I think it was just, I think it was just fear and, um, you know, over and over again, it was like, oh no, this time it's, you know, like it's about to be over. You just have to do this one more thing. And so it's like, you so badly want it to be over. So you're like, oh, okay, you know, like, fine. Okay. Like what's another, you know, X when I've already given him Y and he's saying it's about to be over and, or he's saying, if I get this, uh, then I'll be able to pay back this. And, uh, you know, and it was like, there was, a, there was like no way out, I guess. Um, yeah. But you know, what do you know now that you didn't know then? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, there's, there's factual things that I, I know now about, you know, his background and, and his having done similar things before. Um, no, just but, in terms of you and how you would navigate that and not let that happen to you now. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's important because I, it, it, you, you know, one thinks that if something like this happens that you're, you're suddenly like inoculated from it ever happening again, but that's not really the case. So, um, cause I've had a, a history of allowing people in my life who've done negative things to me and then realizing after the fact, like, Oh, why did I do that? So, um, I, I, I feel like I'm finally awake to it in a way that now I wouldn't let it happen again. Um, and that's why I really appreciate, um, you know, quiet time and 
anything that helps lead to self-awareness. Um, I kind of want to do ayahuasca with you and Oscar De La Hoya. <laughs> I, I, I've been to your podcast. Talk about bad I, decisions. No, 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 no. But you, you know, I, the, the, um, you know, the sort of healing from like breakthroughs and self-awareness yeah. that, that can come from, um, uh, doing, um, certain types of mushrooms or whatnot in those, in those settings is Absolutely. something that I'm, I'm kind of craving. Yeah. Um, and I think my experience with LSD and mushrooms when I was very young doesn't count. I didn't have any life changing experiences from that, but, yeah. um, I'm very open to, I've always been very open to any kind of, um, any kind of like therapy or, or anything that would help in terms of, um, greater understanding of the self. Yeah. Well, you're, you're definitely on this journey and you're, um, a lot of people can, and, and this will be great because they'll look towards you for insights because you've been through it and you've been through the belly of the beast for sure. But I think one of the things that'll happen along this journey is not only self-awareness, but self-empowerment, um, which is really key with you, um, and boundaries. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's so many cliches that people could have thrown at you watching your journey going, if someone shows you who they are, you got to take that in. This guy continuously right. showed you who he was and you kept just uh, just denying reality and what you were seeing and going and doubling down and going deeper. And it was just maddening watching it and we couldn't stop watching it. Yeah, I mean, it's been an interesting process writing a, a book about it, which I'm kind of almost done and struggling with the last part, mostly because it's hard to wade back into that mess yeah, and, and figure it out. And I got really lucky that I was able to recover so much material. So, you know, he he deleted all of our email correspondence Um and and then he took my phone and my my email at the end and then delete and was corresponding with other people as me but then also when i finally got back into my gmail he had deleted all of my emails back and forth with him and um also i thought our all of our g chats i don't know it's like i don't know why people don't g chat anymore but that was a thing for a while everybody was g chat like if you have gmail you g chat okay and so he and I would G chat a lot and was, somehow I realized that it was actually still there. So I was able to get most of that back and reading through that stuff for me has been, you know, eye opening and fascinating, especially the extent to which I pushed back on him, um, you know, pushed back on him so that, you know, and I'm yelling at him, like you, you lied to me over and over again, but then I would still, ultimately do what he wanted me to do. And, and what's interesting to me is there is a psychologist that I'm friendly with who thinks that he must have used um, neuro-linguistic programming or, uh, you know, the word hypnotism is like loaded with all kinds of weird perception, you know, ideas about what that is. But, you know, it's hard for me to explain, like I'm, I'm yelling at him, you know, I'm, I'm reading my words that I typed, yelling back at him, you know, like, sarcastically yelling at him and making fun of him and, and being like, you're a liar. No, I won't do this. And he's trying to get me to send him a wire. And I'm like, fuck you, fuck off. Like, um, and then, you know, and then the conversation ends and it's clear that like, he must've come back or something, or it's like another day or two before the conversation resumes where I can read it. And, and then I'll look at the records and be like, Oh, I, I sent him a wire for $50,000. And it's like, mm okay so um i mean he definitely had a lot more power over me when i was in his presence um and and the hard part is that i don't remember a lot, most of that so i don't remember you know what happened when he came back or what he said or i don't remember a lot of that so i think that there's always going to be a lot of things that i don't you know that i don't ever get answers to um and you know, hopefully from here I can, you know, use what I've learned to, to help other people, um, you know, help other people from stepping into the same 
same sort of situation. Yeah. I mean, there were so many red flags that we were covered in redness. It was like, Mm -hmm. it was like uh, a modern day Macbeth. It was, it was, it was absolute madness. Um, for, For me watching it, it was kind of fascinating because he kept playing into, and you tell me, but your idea of, the perfect life. He kept going back to that. He kept going back to the happily ever after that. Yeah. I mean, I think that, so he tapped into my being in a situation where I had this, you know, I had this amazing business full of people that I loved and we were doing a great thing and people really loved us and they loved what we did, but kind of behind the scenes, I was struggling And, you know, I had all these ambitions for what I wanted to do with it. And I had people coming at me saying, you know, you should do this and you should do that. And talking about how I could, um, you know, grow the business. And in a lot of situations, um, in a lot of situations, it would be men that would come to me and, oh, you know, I'm going to invest and I can help you grow your business and take care of your past um, debts. What? the film also didn't cover was um, because of my situation with um, the, my original partner in the restaurant, Matthew, uh, and my involvement in, with him and his previous businesses, I was left in a situation with an enormous amount of personal debt. Um, and, and I, you know, that's not who I am at all. I, I you know, I, I went to undergrad business school and all of my stuff was always very buttoned up and reconciled and everything was always paid on time. And I had a perfect credit record. And, um, you know, I earned money when I worked at, uh, you know, good money when I worked at Bain Capital and, um, and had done really well for myself and then allowed somebody to, um, benefit from that in a way that left me in a bad situation. So, I sort of was always, you know, like in this feeling stuck and and needing to get out of the situation. And, um, and I was heartbroken at the time too, because I had had a, a, you know, a really good relationship. And that was like, kind of was the only time I'd ever been felt heartbroken. So I was in in a pretty vulnerable situation when he found me. But Mm. um, I think he, you know, he knew how much I wanted to be able to grow the business and and do what I want to do on my own terms and not have to answer to in particular what I was, you know, sensitive about was, was these sort of men that would come around like, you know, I can grow your business and then it would kind of get really weird and icky. And um, that was a bit, that was a bit frustrating. When you say weird and icky, I can grow your business, but and uh, just, uh, yeah, like a lot of, uh, you know, like men that would come around with, you know, who have a lot of resources and then it would get weird. Like, um, you know, like they thought like maybe we would date or something like that. So it would just kind of get icky in that way. And, and it was sort of frustrating cause I would, I would want to, um, you know, I, I wanted to be empowered to, to grow my business and not be not be in a position where I'm even having to entertain these these types of situations. Right. So there were, these guys had ulterior motives, all these other guys. And and I keep no, not knowing what to call him, Anthony Fox. Um, yeah. So he presented himself in a different way. Right. And, 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 and how was that different than all these other guys that were presenting themselves as the knight in shining armor, but you have to date them. So he presented himself as. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, he, he, um, yeah, he was very different about that and also claimed to understand that that's how I felt. So I think he presented it and like, as if he was going to be releasing me from all of that. Or at least that he saw that that's what I was going through and that's what I'd been through. And, um, 
you know, that it was it was very much about like empowerment. So he kept playing into your need to feel empowered. And by doing that, he was making you powerless. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Huh. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I hope that I, I hope to be able to help people understand. I think it's important for people to understand that that in various contexts, not just the one that I was in, but that that people like him exist. And, um, you know, I'm very careful about the word, but I think that there needs to be a much better understanding of um Uh, People talk a lot about, you know, malignant narcissism, but kind of taking it a step further to sociopathy. Um, And I think that not understanding that that's something that exists out there ends up getting a lot of people hurt. Did you truly believe that there weren't sociopaths out there? No, I knew that there were. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I didn't, you know, I, I couldn't wrap my brain around him doing something like that to me. You know, I mean, now it's weird because now I look at it and I go, oh, OK, well, I, I see what he did and I see what his motivations were. Um, but but it's still hard to wrap. It's still hard to wrap your brain around that that somebody could be that sort of diabolically destructive where it's, it's as if his goal wasn't even to like take money from me so that he could have it. And, you know, it wasn't like this straightforward con. It was more like how, how much could he ruin me? And, and then also make it so that I burn all my bridges and, um, you know, it was as if, you know, it was as if the goal was specifically to destroy me and my future prospects versus like him getting money and running off with it. Cause he didn't run off with a bunch of money. He just, Spent it because he doesn't care. He he doesn't care about the money or he's addicted to gambling and he's a sociopath. I think all of those, I think that can be an and, not an or. Okay. You- because I think what I understand is the gambling is you know, people who have that personality, it's like, it's not so much, it's like a need for a certain type of stimulation. Um, and, and, uh, so people who are not sociopaths who have an addiction to gambling is probably a much more straightforward. You could look at it in the framework of other addictions. Whereas with him, I think losing money and winning money was like not a big deal. Um, and I think it, it fits in with why, you know, in, in his off time, he was always sitting there playing Call of Duty, like like they sort of need this kind of stimulation. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because you instead of saying meditation, you said medication and everything. You, I, but, no, no, I know. But I hold on for a second. Was that, it, was that like a Freudian slip? Uh, I think so. In the way that everything you're talking about is, you know, the call of duty, gambling, um, your need to fill up your brain and and to watch these shows. And that's all medication Mm -hmm. because it's really hard to face ourselves. Um, But it's the work of our it's it's our life's work. Um, and I, th- yeah. I think, I think that ultimately this is, and this is, forgive me, but I think this is going to ultimately be a blessing for you. This whole thing, you're going to look back on this and go, okay. Cause you keep saying like, dest- he was, you know, you didn't know he was going to destroy your life and, and burn all your bridges with all these people. You know, when you're in it, there's nothing more painful. Um, and, and then for whatever reason you have to look back on it and go, okay, this happened because, um, you know, I, I think that we have, we have opportunities in our life, you know, um, this is a very strange jump right now that I'm about to take, but watching, yeah, that's fine. watching Will Smith 
have a complete breakdown um, at the Oscars when he it 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 didn't look appropriate mm-hmm. for anything that was happening. Chris Rock tells a very mundane joke about a G a GI Jane sequel to J, mm-hmm. Jada, who has a very short haircut, and Will snaps um, because of severe repressed you know, um, trauma and, Mm -hmm. um, his life is going to take a major, major, major turn. I'm not comparing him or her to you in any way. I'm just saying, I think that these are incredible opportunities in our lives when we're brought to our knees. Um, Mm -hmm. whether you deserve that or not is not what we're talking about, but it's an opportunity to to really go inward and face ourselves and and to, to do that hard work and and be truthful with ourselves and figure out the best way that we can live this finite amount of time that we're here on the highest vibration possible i i don't know how or why i'm saying these things i, I get i'm not qualified to say these things but i'm saying them because i believe them to be true because i've also lived it i mean i it sounds like, you know, I don't, I'm, well, I'm sort of curious when, how long you've been, because I, I did, I did go back and listen to a lot of your um, podcasts. So I, I, I've learned a lot and I know meditation is really important on a consistent, regular basis. Um, and I was curious when that started, because I mean, I, I do find it increasingly useful and helpful um, and um so when when something happened to me when I was brought to my knees and nothing made sense and everything that I worked for was taken away for nothing and none of it was true when that happened and nothing makes sense I just knew intrinsically that I needed to meditate every day. It wasn't like a, it wasn't me trying to figure out or being premeditated. It was like, oh, okay, yeah, I need to, because I had always meditated, but I didn't, I wasn't doing it every day and I didn't Mm -hmm. have that consistent practice. And so, which is very clear, like, oh yeah, I have to do this every day. Um, Do you do it first thing? And yeah, and this will be the way to survive. So at that moment, it wasn't about, anything other than surviving. Cause I think when someone goes through what I went through or what, what you went through, um, not to compare them, but, um, you have to find ways to, um, to not fall into a hole and fall, you know, deeper into despair. Um, and to try to, uh, figure out the, the best way to, to thrive and live and and evolve, um, and so that it all starts with that. Um, I asked a a guy who was a kind of a mentor to me. I said, "What what happens if you don't meditate?" And he, by the way, he wasn't preaching meditation. Whatever, he just was a very cool, present guy that was a great healer. Um, I said, "What happens if you don't meditate?" And he said, "Oh, I'm, I'm totally lost. I'm." I, I just, you know, I I have these doubts and fears and I'm always constantly thinking and doubting myself and, and going over negative thoughts and, and I can't be present and, and all these different things. And I'm like, oh, so you're like everyone else. <laughs> right. You're, you're a mortal person if you don't meditate. Okay. So, you know, um, it's just a, a really great option to have in this life. Um because the greatest trick the devil ever did was convincing us he doesn't exist. And I, you know, I kind of think sometimes without getting too weird that maybe these thoughts, these negative thoughts that come into our our minds, you know, is kind of the devil. And we can either fall prey to him and and let them lead us around and and continue to doubt ourselves and, and operate out of fear, which a lot of people do unfortunately and um we're living right now in a fear-based society and and the media certainly is playing off of all of our fears 
um, yeah. showing us, you know, the death tolls of COVID and everything else and what's going on. And, and, you know, so that we can be addicted to, you know, what's coming up next. Um, and the, you got to follow the money and no one's policing the media. And that's a whole other story. So we're living in the yeah. challenging times. Yeah. And I think that there, you know, we're the people's kind of wanting to latch on to some sort of a cause or some kind of an, some kind of outrage or something to be mad about um, is, is being taken advantage of where, um, you know, we're in this place where, where issues suddenly are like black and, you know, like you're, you're on this side or you're on this side, there's not an in-between. Um, and I feel like with almost every issue, there is an in-between and, um, yeah. And, you know, certainly in certain ways, like there's this pendulum that has swung very far and yeah. it's like, can we just get back to a more rational place or at least look at each situation in, um, um, you know, in isolation, not lumping everything together. I mean, I, as I'm sure you know, it's like there's an ocean of difference between like, Harvey Weinstein and Al Franken, right? Mm. You know, it's like they're, it's just not even comparable. Yet, all of these things that have happened that have kind of pushed everybody towards like the Harvey Weinstein end of the spectrum. Um, and I think there's been a lot of um, damage as a result of that. And I, and one of the things that I, I don't understand is people's, um, you know, for me, it's like I feel responsible because all these other people were hurt and I feel responsible for that. And I think it must be challenging if um, being in a situation where like an entire show is canceled. And, and I don't understand why that's happening, why that's happened so much, because all of these other people, th that's their project as well. Um, and so, yeah, it just seems like this, this, you know, amplified like sledgehammer coming down in a situation where that doesn't seem like the appropriate response um well, yeah. and, and is not helpful yeah uh, that's what i'm saying you know in a time where there for the past few years everything has been amplified and there has been no due process and we have been operating guilty until proven is and, and there is no gray area. Um, how do we figure out a way to live our best lives and be totally present right. and to go back to you saying, when did you start med uh, meditating? It, it was then. And you know, it's, it's a process and you just gotta, you gotta not beat yourself up about it and just try to get in there and, and kind of do it all the time and do the best you can. And, and I think one of the reasons why you gravitate towards Leon is these, these little guys are like, they're like little Buddhas, you know, they're just totally, yeah. they're totally present without any agenda. And they've got this, you know, unconditional love. And we, we feel incredible just being around them. And somehow to go back to, our, to your, to your ex, um, he somehow tapped into a way of saying that feeling you get with Leon, I have a way for you to really feel that forever. Yeah. I mean, he, so I had, I had written something online, which I, I put back up online about, you know, the, kind of the story of when I, when I adopted him and it felt like, um, you know, nobody knows the answer to these things, but it, it felt very destined, right? It felt like I had no choice. I wasn't intending to adopt a dog. I didn't, I, I was trying to get, it was actually out. Like I was trying to convince him to adopt a dog. And then, it, and then I saw Leon's picture and somehow I got weirdly fixated on it. And it turned into this thing where it really felt like it was like a force beyond me. Like I, like I have no choice. I have to get him. I don't know why, but I have to, I have to go get him. Um, and so it felt like he was like, somehow this was like meant to be. And so I think that my feeling that way was something that, um, that he leveraged. Cause then he tried to sort of claim that like he sent Leon to me. And, um, and I mean, the, the, the film and the, and the tabloids early on did sort of latch on to this idea of his being, 
you know, I believed he would be immortal. He's kicking pillows at me right now off the couch. Um, he he then, see he can feel this right now. Right, I know. He's like, stop talking about me. Yeah. Um, but um, enough, mom. I mean, but, Aren't we past this? I know. I mean, the funny thing is, like, because of the film, and then um, I know you you talked about NFTs too. So I, I think I'm doing an NFT related to to Leon, or, or putting him into an NFT and and doing a project related to that. And 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 then it's it's almost a way of actually kind of immortalizing him. Um, you know, if not in his current form, um, mm. at least in, you know, in the NFT world, in, um, you know, in, in other, by other means, kind of immortalizing him. So. So he, he tapped into, he, he said, listen, you have this incredible connection with your dog, Leon, and I sent you Leon. So the the feeling that you get from leon that came from me and i love you and yeah. i celebrate you and you're an incre you're incredible now write me another check bitch i mean that's <laughs> I, I, i'm just bring me up to speed yeah. that, that's what's happening okay i uh, pre pretty much i mean okay. it, um yeah i mean, without without saying those words right um, of course he made me feel as if increasingly kind of he was in control of everything you said you're an empath. That means that you're very incredibly open. I think, and again, I'm going to talk about things that I know not of. I think mm -hmm. you are so open. You need to figure out boundaries and how to close some of that a bit. You need to figure out because you're, you're so open and trusting and, and it's led you to all this. Um, because for you, because you wanted to believe that this guy sent you Leon, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think he, he created a, a narrative and situations and circumstances where he, it, it, I was increasingly incentivized to want to believe him. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to explain how somebody, you know, takes control of your mind when that that happened. And it, it's like it, it's inherently hard to understand because if it was easy to understand, it would be easier for it not to happen. But um, and, and I think that, again, the, the whole empath thing, it's something that somebody said, oh, you should look into this. And then I looked into it and I've read books about it. But, you know, if you just the very basic, like, here's 15 things that, you know, if you identify with these, you're an empath. And I thought, oh, well, it's like a screaming yes on all 15 of those. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think that and then I think it's a separate a separate issue is like issues around self-confidence and, and boundaries. And I've, I've certainly gotten myself into all kinds of trouble by not being that good with boundaries. And I think, you know, weirdly, I suppose it's ironically, he used to say to me, you know, you need to stop caring so much what other people think. Um, and that, that's, that's one of the things that makes um, putting up boundaries hard is so, you know, you don't want people to think you're like a bitch or rude. And so you're too nice. And then when you're too nice, that leads people to think, you know, something that you don't really intend for them to think. And then that opens a door you didn't intend to open. And then, you know, and then it just escalates from there. Um, so he was so, he was really giving you the illusion that he was there to empower you. He's saying things yeah, like, forget and, and, about what people say to you. So this is where it overlaps a lot with cults and cult leaders, because that's all about, um, you know, empowerment and self-improvement and, um, you know, yeah, I mean, there's so much overlap with with the cult psychology and the, and the, the tools that they use, um, including sort of creating this like very us versus them and mm. um, sort of almost being like your kind of guru and 
framing everything as if it's for your benefit and your own self-improvement and your empowerment and, and also for a greater good. So that's also something that's very commonly exploited um, in people. So if you, if you tend to be sort of idealistic and want to like do good things in the world, that's very often, you know, a lot of people join cults for that reason. They think they're, they're joining a good thing and they're going to like make the world a better place. And, um, so what, that that's okay. was this relationship totally different than your other romantic relationships or was this on par totally different totally different okay yeah yeah and and it was um yeah ugh, yeah it was sort of grotesque and then it became increasingly grotesque um so yeah it was it was very different At a certain point, when you're recognizing how grotesque it was, and yes, he was manipulating you, how much of a variable was it that you had given him so much money that you felt like you couldn't turn back? I mean, I think that must have been psychologically extremely powerful because it's like this tethering where... Um, um, you know, I mean, he's he's made me believe that I'm that he's just kind of put it all over here and I'm going to get it all back. And then some and all, you know, and everybody, anybody that I've borrowed money from or everybody's going to get paid back like 10 times over and they'll be taken care of and everything is going to be great and fine. And so, you know, and he's making it and it just over time, it got worse and worse and worse, where for me to step away from it, I would have had to. I would have had to, you know, if I stepped away suddenly, like if I just on my own instead of via the process of being arrested, but if I'd on my own, like pulled myself away, I would have had to be like, yep, I, I believe this crazy guy. And I, the, I did all these things and I let all these things happen. And so, you know, you don't want that to be the outcome. And, and he's there in a, in his own bizarrely um, compelling way assuring me that that's not the case. So of course it's easier to, to, um, you know, to want to cling on to that belief that it actually, that everything is going to be okay, that you're, you know, because what he's done is over time created this increasingly horrific nightmare that like, if I don't believe him, then the horrible nightmare is true. And then the nightmare is getting scarier and scarier. So, and then of course, in the end, the nightmare was true. Um, and so, yeah, I'm probably one of the rare people out there where I feel great affection for the um, detective and officers who appeared to arrest me. So um, what, not only because they, they, what would you say to anyone who is in fear of, navigating or you know falling susceptible to this what would you say to someone who uh, to avoid this ever happening to them um i probably need to get more organized about this because there's a there's a lot of things but um um you know there's a lot of things to be wary of and you know isolation is a big one you know not being able to talk to other people about it um you know, I mean, there, there's very early things that one should be wary of, like, um, you know, with respect to any type of a, a con situation. But very early on is, you know, if, if you know, he, he had this whole story for why he didn't have like an online presence or a background that made sense. And obviously now it's, you know, for him to have said that he worked in these like clandestine operations is just is laughable. But it's a very con it's it's very common that these types of usually guys say that because it's because you're not able to verify it you can't just google online does he work for this place or that place um so kind of not not being like getting involved with anybody where you you can't um kind of view their entire like social professional network life and history that that is like a initial screaming red flag. Um, and, and also just, 
you know, I think most of us have I, being able to learn to trust your intuition, but, um, you know, somehow I, I didn't, you know, again, it's, it's like, it's, it's weird to look back and be able to point at all the waving, you know, flaming on fire, red flags and see them now so easily, but at the, at the time, not seeing them or, or rationalizing them away somehow. Um, so, and, and I think just also like taking things slow, um, a very common thing that happens in these types of circumstances is they call it love bombing, but it's like where you're kind of very overwhelmed very quickly with, um, you know, with, with their attention and input and um, any kind of narrative about like, you know, we're meant to be and any, a lot of those things are, are kind of screaming red flags. And that's really what he was using with you. And that's why I, what I was referring to when he kept saying to you, don't you want this heavy, ha happily ever after? You know, he wasn't just talking about with your business. He was talking about the two of you being happy and married and, and being in love and, and all that goes along with it. Correct? Mm, kind, not really. I think he knew that wasn't my... I think he knew that wasn't my main motivation. It was more the happily ever after was more me and my future and my, and the business and, and all of the things that I wanted to accomplish. It was less about, about him, which, you know, I think he, he knew enough to know that that was my motivation. Cause I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm kind of unusual in that I've never, um, you know, like getting married has never been a goal. I've never wanted, um, for whatever reason, I've never wanted children. And so I've never had that kind of, you know, the sort of, you know, my goal has never been, what what I want for my future is more about creating something lasting and um, actually doing something good for the world and leaving something like that behind. It's not about marriage and kids. And, and that's very, you know, it's it took me a while to, to understand um, and be able to be okay with um, there's a, there's some weird judgment that comes when you're, you know, a female and, you know, you're like, mm, I don't want kids. It's almost as if there's like, what's wrong with you. Um, but that's, that's always how I've been. And now at my age too, there's like a, sometimes I get this reaction where people think like, Oh, almost as if, like a sympathy that I, that I, at my age, because now it's pretty much too late probably, but to have kids and I, ne but I never wanted, I never wanted kids. And I actually, I'm, I'm like <laughs> relieved that I never had kids. Um, um, and, and yeah, we're having this conversation on the day that this whole Roe v. Wade thing is happening. Um, but that, that, that's something that I now understand about myself in a way that um, I'm okay. I understand it better and can um, kind of defend it more articulately, I think. There's just a lot of judgment that comes sometimes when you're um, like, as if there's something wrong with me that if I didn't want to have kids. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 yeah, one of the greatest lessons is to never compare ourselves to anyone else. That's, you know, nobody wins when you do that. Um, I've got a great mother who happens to be Jewish, but she's not a Jewish mother in that way. <laughs> um, and she's not, you know, just like, where are my grandchildren? She just wants me to be in something and, and be in in love and so it almost makes it worse because my mom is so cool and she's just yeah you know she's just saying look at just be in love dummy stop this horrible right. char charade it would almost be more interesting if she was this doting you know overbearing jewish mother then i could just write her off but the fact that she is so cool and loving and present and amazing speaking of which as soon as we're done i'm going to go visit her which is going to be amazing and i'm you, uh, you you spend a lot of time with her. Yeah, I'm I'm very lucky. She's close. She's close to me here. Yeah, she's not too not too far away, and um, yeah, um, a lot of times when when 
when people are older, they put them in homes and, and these people don't feel connected or vital or and they die. And so it's important when people reach a certain age just to keep them engaged. Oh, yeah, I think so, too. I mean, yeah, my father's um, I think he's 83 now. Um, but yeah, he's very engaged. You know, he was a physicist and he's retired from that, but he's very engaged in this bread business. And um, I think a hundred percent, you know, having, having a purpose and having something to, to be engaged in, and a, a purpose, you know, something to kind of work on um, is probably is huge for older people. But what do I know? We're just, <laughs> we're on our way. How does he feel about, has he has he ever been really open and and brutally honest with you about what he feels, you know, how he feels about what happened to you? Um, um, no, I don't think so. Um, I think I, you know, I come from a his background is one that you know talking about emotions is, does not come naturally. And, and I inherited that or also grew up in that environment. So we don't sit around having these very open conversations. Um, but, um, you know, in a weird way, I think we did get a bit closer. You know, he came to visit me, I think at least four times when I was at Rikers, um, and it's, a, it's not like you just pop by and visit. It's kind of a huge pain in the butt ordeal all day thing and very unpleasant and lots of bus rides and uncomfortable, awkward searches and, and whatnot. And he insisted, and I kept saying, you know, like, you really don't have to keep coming here. Like, it's fine. I don't, you know, the visits are kind of a pain in the butt for me too. Cause I got to go down and then I got to do like squats and change and, you know, the whole ordeal. Um, but he kept insisting on coming to see me. Um, and, um, I know that I think there was something about my going through this that, um, made, made us in some way a bit, a bit closer. That's great. That's a, that is a very beautiful thing that came from <laughs> it. But I think parents, you know, they have, th that was his moment to still be your dad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and one, one thing about, you know, my parents that I appreciate is that they both are, um, you know, they're very different, but they're both, um, um, it freezes. very like not judgmental people. So, um, yeah, my father wasn't, they, they, they're, they're very open-minded and understanding and, and not, um, I had a lot of freedom. Um, maybe too much so, in some ways. Yeah. I mean, early on I had a lot of freedom and I think I navigated it well and handled it well. Um, you know, when I was young, having a lot of, a lot of freedom, but, um, um, and, and probably in a way that, that contributed to my not having boundaries or not being able to put up a lot of boundaries for myself. Mm. Um, so yeah, there are some trade-offs. I mean, I think, being raised in a certain way means, you know, I'm very independent, but then also not good at putting up boundaries and whatnot. So. And it's interesting because you talk about in bad vegan, you talk about the fact that, um, Alec Baldwin, who you almost had this relationship with said, Hey, let's, mm -hmm. let's go away together. And, and you felt it was, well, you tell me what you felt. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, I don't know that he said let's go away together, but I, I do know that. Um, um, I mean, I, I know that that he wanted, you know, he wanted. I don't know. I don't. I always feel funny talking about other people, but I feel like he wanted a, you know, he wanted children and whatnot, and it just seems kind of crazy that he he found Alaria at my restaurant. And it seemed like he found Alaria at my restaurant 
and and then via him talking to this guy online, I, I, I found Mr. Fox. So it almost seemed like it sort of played into that. Like, I mean, if it, like if it was set up that way in some weird way, it was like it played into that idea of um, things almost being weirdly like destined, you know, like the way that I, I got Leon because of Alec, I was trying to convince him to get a dog. And that's the only reason why I was looking at dogs. And I was like, mm. you need to get, a, you need to adopt a dog. And, and that's how I got Leon. And so then, and then it just like, so happens that, you know, he came into the restaurant one night and met Alaria and, and I'm very happy that that happened for him and he sort of got what he wanted. And then the fact that I then met Mr. Fox via like their Twitter conversations, it all seemed like, you know, part of some, you know, like as if it was a story or a movie, like it was all meant to be. And this is going to be a story. It's going to be possibly a series on NBC, correct? Oh, I have nothing to do with that. And oh, okay. I kind of want to like vomit over that oh. because um, I think, you know, I suppose I can only hope it will be horribly done. I don't know, because I've had my own, I've always thought I've had my own visions about um, how the story could be told. Bless you. This, the story could be told in a, um, in like a long form way. So people have said, Oh, this should be a movie. And it's like, well, no, not really. It's like, there's so much nuance and stuff that happens slowly over time with the slow build that like, it would only make sense in the, in, in like a, a breaking bad sort of long series with, you know, episode after episode. And, and um, so I've always envisioned it in that way and having all the conversations and knowing how slow, how it happened slowly over time and all the weird little subtle things that happened. I feel like it could only properly be told in this very long form way. Um, you know, which is something I've always thought would would make sense, but uh, apparently somebody is doing something off to the side in a, in a way that I have no involvement. But I think that seems to happen a lot in these cases where there's like a public story, and there's a kind of a version of it done. You you have to stop being surprised because, um, <laughs> no 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 I I I I mean that in the best way. I mean that in like. Um, we want people to be good, and I get that. And I, I'm not saying be jaded, but just be open to the fact that they might. Everyone's going through their own struggle, and maybe their actions to us are incredibly um, short sighted or self consumed or whatever. And, you know, you have to be open to the possibility that things just don't make sense and we're going to try to make sense of them, you know, but um, to rail against the world and get freaked out about it doesn't make any sense. I'm telling you, man, a lot of stuff doesn't make sense. I mean, you, <laughs> you're like the poster child for it. I feel like sometimes, but yeah. Yeah, probably. I mean, I do tend to like, yeah. I mean, I, I know, I think especially in, um, you know, the way this film came about, we had talked to other parties and whatnot. And there's, I feel like there is a lot of that um, kind of telling you what you want to hear. Yeah. Um, in order to get you to do something. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I probably need like a, some sort of a protective barrier or constant like bullhorn reminder that that is very often the case and that um, I'm probably too likely to, to trust and think that, um, you know, like, well, if they're telling me this is the way it's going to be, then surely that's the way it's going to be. But because why would they tell me otherwise? But well, I've listen, I'm from Chicago and, and I was surrounded by hardworking people and communities who were in theater communities. who are all in it together. So I kind of came out to Hollywood feeling the same thing. I had no idea yeah. that people would lie to me to get me to do anything. And then suddenly I'm on a set and they had said to me, oh, when I said, OK, well, I'm going to be on this particular show, but I've watched it and 
it's not for me. It's not my demographic. It doesn't make me laugh. Um, so I don't know why you would have me on it. And also, I'm an improviser. And, you know, would I be allowed to do that? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, I can. Yeah. So I can improvise. Oh, yes. Can I turn in storylines? For sure. So I can be a part of the creative process. A thousand percent. Smash cut to me on set on the day. And I attempt to add something, some dialogue, you know, and they yell cut and they come over and go, what are you doing? And I was like, am I not on my mark? What's what's happening? They said, no, no, please don't improvise. Don't stick to the script. And everything started going into slow motion. And at that moment, I realized, oh, okay. Everyone had said whatever I wanted to hear to get me to that moment. And I signed a six-year contract. And I'm now yep. involved in something creatively for six years in which I am a, you know, a very specific cog in the machine. And I was told it was one thing and it's another. Kind of like your entire life for the past 10 years. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I have, uh, I have been kind of roped into uh, people ask a lot about like where this certain footage comes from, because somebody um, a long time ago made a reel. People kept wanting me to do shows or like be a host or, do all this stuff in TV and I was never comfortable with any of that. Um, and, and so sometimes people had ways of convincing me that it would be otherwise and roping me into some of that. Um, but some of that footage from a long time ago is, is from one of those, those things where somebody made a reel for a show that, you know, luckily it didn't happen because I would have been wildly uncomfortable doing it. Anyway. Yeah, but you have to understand that anyone who I'm sure you've ever talked to that does unscripted, they edit it and it's a new version of what it is. And it's completely out of your hands and they can create whatever narrative they want. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And then and I think that happened to some extent on this um, latest project where which is why, you know, I sort of felt like like the mm, the the if it's going to be called a documentary and in that category, there should be certain standards. And then maybe there should be another category of like docutainment or mm. some sort of quasi reality ish something where everybody kind of knows that there's like a, you know, it's not necessarily meant to be, um, you know, like a journalistic thing telling the truth and facts and, and whatnot. Um, well, all I can tell you from, from my journey, because I've been I've been kind of in the public eye for a little bit longer than you, is that um, for the love of God, don't take any of this personally. Yeah. You know, you just can't. And, and this is a great lesson for you because you are very you're very open and um, you feel things deeply and just for your own safety. And, you know, you can, you have to separate yourself from this stuff. You really do. Yeah. I mean, it, it is. Um, yeah, it is. It, it is hard not to take things personally. That's definitely something that requires a lot of work. And there's um, there's sort of a couple of different levels. And I'm, you know, I'm sure you're aware of this or have experienced this, too. But there's like the level of people are going to think what they want to think and have judgments. And then there's the level of people having judgments based on things that are factually incorrect or, you know, like a misperception. And then to what extent do you push back on that or just go, you know what, I don't care. Um, yeah, this sort of like multiple levels of not taking things personally. Yeah, we, we can't make people the way we would like them to be. Um, uh, you know, trying to be liked by everyone is a losing game in which you will throw. Mm -hmm. And if you want to chase that, you'll throw away your life. So I don't know why we're getting so deep and and um, but we are. Yeah, <laughs> maybe the, maybe this conversation needs to be continued. We have to keep checking in with you along your journey. I mean, I, I do feel like um, I have to be careful going forward. And, um, and I think I do have this fear of like, you know, anytime I have a particularly busy day, I get, I get that, I get a little bit of anxiety if I haven't had time to like do my morning pages and kind of stop and think about things, um, which is all new for me. 
like, I think I've felt very comforted by having quiet time and solitude and time to process things. Um, so I get a bit nervous when things start to get crazy and I, you know, I'm, I'm working on a few different things and I think about now stepping into another phase of my life where things are going to start to get crazy again um, with just an enormous amount of incoming and like, can, am I going to be able to handle that? And can I hopefully navigate through that without stepping into anything, um, you know, without realizing what I'm stepping into or making any missteps or whatnot along the way. Um, but at least I'll have benefited from the awareness that that's a possibility. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, you know, you can, you can get overwhelmed by your fears, you know, and they, they can be crippling or you can just em embrace it, you know, embrace the journey and, you know, we, we've all been beaten up now. Um, and I'd like to say the worst is over. That would be great. That would be wonderful. We, um, but, you know, what you say to yourself is also very powerful. So, you know, think about what you say to yourself and do you beat yourself up? And would you say those things to other people? Oh, yeah, you know? I work on that. I work on that a lot. Uh, 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 you know, being aware of what I am saying to myself in words or otherwise and trying to kind of think about things in a positive way and um and also um you know with my entire situation it's like what are what are my stresses and pains right now they're related to numbers right debt is just numbers and pieces of paper and circumstances and things but the reality is i have leon and i have a home and i'm alive and nobody in my situation died. And so, you know, when you think about other things going on in the world, it's very humbling. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's a great perspective. And it's all about perspective. I mean, life is a miracle. We're here. We're lucky to be here. I'm lucky to be talking yeah, I mean, to you. It's like, I mean, my, my fears are related mostly around, yeah, things that have to do with kind of numbers and like feeling shame and stuff like that. Whereas I'm not afraid at this moment of incoming bombs or being shot or, right. um, you know, or survival mm. on, a, on a very basic level. So um, I, I was just a few hours from the, from the border of the Ukraine in, in Slovakia. And, um, you know, I was, I was around a lot of the Ukrainian refugees and, and just feeling that energy and how strong they were and how strong they, they had to be. Um, and mm -hmm. it, it's an it, it's an incredible perspective to have. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We are we are not running for our lives right now. Um, right. And I think that. Yeah. And I I think it started with the. Um, um, the hearing for the the you know, the new Supreme court justice where suddenly we shifted from like everybody paying attention to what's going on in Ukraine with shifting to like, nah, we're all getting bored with it. And now let's move on to like the next thing. And then, you know, and then Will Smith punching Chris rock was like all everybody's talking about. And I um, thought about, you know, what that feels like if you're in Ukraine and suddenly their, their story is no longer the story. Now it's Will Smith punching Chris Rock, the Oscars. And um, um, I think one of the things that is sort of related, but what, it's weird to say, but I don't mind my having spent four months at Rikers because I think that I, I just learned so much from that experience that feels, I don't know, enriching in some way um, or valuable. But one of the things that I think happens is, um, and I think about with other people that are gone, that are sent away is that there's this feeling like everybody's going to forget about you. You know, you've been written off. And, and I feel like that with, um, I, weirdly, I had this before I ever knew or would have ever imagined that I would have gone and been incarcerated myself. But um, but they're sort of like forgotten and written off. And so I feel like a little bit sensitive to 
people sort of forgetting about what's going on or, or moving on to other things. And I think that that happens with, um, I mean, the, the, tons of people are rightfully incarcerated for very legitimate reasons, but then there's a lot of people who are wrongfully incarcerated or incarcerated for like, you know, selling weed and that is fucked up. And um, uh, yeah, I think that's one of the, the tragedies about those situations is, is like, when you're there feeling like you're forgotten and really weirdly in a sort of almost like a, like a dramatic sort of a way, the, the little unit place where I was at Rikers, I had a clear view of the Manhattan skyline. So if, you know, when I went over to the window, I could look out and like from far away, I could see from Rikers, the place where I spent those four months, I could see the whole Manhattan skyline and, you know, it was the summertime and looking out and knowing that, like, all these people I know are now sitting at outdoor cafes and drinking wine and and then feeling like here I am stuck and forgotten. But yet I knew I was getting out and my situation is very different. But, um, I, yeah, I think that created a, a bit of an extra sensitivity for me about, you know, it, it sort of resonates when I when I see something where people might feel like they're they're being um forgotten so yeah i hope that people <laughs> continue to pay attention to what's um happening there and what's important and how lucky we are yeah and and how yeah i mean and and again same thing i mean my my stresses and anxieties and things are kind of related to they're not life or death um at this moment so um, yeah. And like a lot of people who've been through some weird shit, it's like you want your situation to be useful because that makes it, um, it makes you feel better about having gone through something. If you can make it useful for other people. Absolutely. And I, I think that you're a very empathetic person and I know you're going to make this as useful as possible to other people. So they can learn from your from this journey and you're going to you feel I feel like you're going to learn and are learning a lot from it as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, while I never wanted to have kids, I feel a weird like a, I feel compelled to pass things along. Um, and I think the process of writing my book is very much the way that I think about it when I'm writing it and when I think about people reading it, I think it would have a wide audience, but in terms of people learning from it, I think a lot about, um, you know, younger women and, and navigating through a world where um, it's easy to have a lot of kind of shame lumped onto you for, for a variety of things. And, um, you know, maybe my having made missteps now going forward in my life because of that, or not really having a good understanding of that, or feeling too easily shamed, or not having boundaries, and all of these things that are kind of complicated to to navigate. So, um, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully, my um, what I put out will be useful. It, it will be very useful, and you learned an incredibly valuable lesson, and you had to learn it publicly. You know, and that's not easy, but um, coming back from all this and doing the work is incredibly that you need to do is incredibly powerful. And um, moving forward, that'll be really empowering. Um, so I, I wish you all the success that you want and all the happiness. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, yeah, shrooms. <laughs> <laughs> you keep going back to shrooms. <laughs> I know. I was listening to, um, you know, Oscar uh, De La Hoya talking about it. And it was, you know, and, and, and I've heard other people talk about it as well, where you sort of have these, like, and I think I have, I, I feel like there's stuff I don't remember that I would like to remember, um, do you do you really you keep mentioning his name? Is there something about Oscar that you identify with? 
Um, that's a good question. I mean, it might be because I listened to that one more recently. Yeah. Um, but you know, I just, I mean, I've heard other people say that about, um, you know, have going through a, either like a, via some sort of shaman or like a, or a psychologist, um, and, and having, your mind opened up in a way that you have some realizations or you remember things, or you learn things that you didn't know. And then kind of going forward, you're, um, you know, that it's just sort of life changing. So I think that's, that's very appealing to me. Um, yeah, I get that. And yeah, um, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm excited about continuing that journey and, uh, I look forward to what's next. So, um, Hopefully we can continue this conversation. Will you, will you have another conversation with us down the line? And we, I'd like to check in with you again. Oh yeah, no, definitely. This is, yeah, I definitely. And almost, yeah, I would, I would appreciate being checked in on actually. Cause okay. um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm working on various things going forward, but um, yeah, the, don't really have the team of people looking after me. May, um, Kyle, my producer here, is suggesting that we do an episode on shrooms. Oh my God, that would be insane! <laughs> that would be that would be that would be. I mean, that would be really interesting. I've always I've always thought it's funny because one of the things I suggested for the for the film, the you know air quotes documentary, I said I would be willing to do is I said I'd be willing to have them film therapy sessions. Like they interviewed this uh, psychologist for an entire day. They interviewed this guy, Evan Stark, who's like the coined the term coercive control. Um, and I said like, well, I would be willing to sit and do therapy sessions and have that filmed, um, which, you know, they weren't down to do, but uh, this would be like that on, um, on shrooms, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I I feel like, yeah, that would be amazing, by the way. I feel like there's a lot that wasn't seen in your documentary that you wanted to be seen. In closing, is there any ideas, thoughts, takes, moments that you wish the public would have seen? Um, there's probably a lot. I mean, I tried to put, I tried to articulate some of that and what I wrote on my website. And then also just knowing that I've written most of a book. And so I have to finish that. Um, and hopefully I'll just have the opportunity to put, put a lot of that stuff out in the, in the future. Um, whatever is most um, useful for people. And um well, it feels like, you know, that you f were portrayed as someone that was insensitive to the people that lost money and that mm -hmm. you couldn't pay. Yeah. And I mean, it, what's kind of, yeah, what's interesting about that is, you know, there's some stuff in my past that was kind of like the polar opposite of that. And I think that my sensitivity about, um, you know, my, my responsibility and fears and shame over having borrowed money from people was something that, um, Anthony, Mr. Fox, like he used that to kind of keep it going. So it, it is particularly strange and, and difficult when you're kind of accused of the thing that was done to you. Um, and, and again, that's one of those times when, you know, you just have to like kind of let it go and be okay with it. And, mm. and that's why I, I kind of wrote what I wrote and then felt yeah. like, all right, well, I'm just gonna, you know, ignore. Mm. That's for heavy. The most part, what say, and then, yeah. you know, and focus on what I'm putting out going forward and focus on trying to make it, um, focus on trying to make it useful. Cause it's not like. It's not so much about, it's not about clearing my name, but what happened was that uh, this whole thing could have been an opportunity for, you know, the greater public. And in particular, and importantly, I think the criminal justice system needs to understand this type of psychological manipulation and abuse. And it's not well understood and therefore, um, you know, 
I mean, I've heard a few horror stories that were much worse than mine. You know, four months is not a big deal, but I've heard of people going away for much longer. And I mm. theoretically could have gone away for much longer. Um, and um, I think in a lot of domestic situations, this type of manipulation occurs and it's it's not as well understood as it should be by the criminal justice system. And in fact, you know, the, what they've called course of control is criminalized in um, other countries and it, it should be here, too. And I think it's easier to do it now than it was in the past because we have so much digital evidence. So it's not, um, you know, physical abuse is more straightforward. There's bruises and more physical evidence, but psychological abuse is harder to document. But now that so much is, you know, we, we have text messages and we have so much stuff digitally, it's easier to to kind of make the case that these things are occurring. Absolutely. I think you made a, a very profound point just now, though, also saying that um, that you have, I'm going to misquote you, but you have to be okay being misunderstood. Yeah. And I, I feel that. And that's been my journey. And there's something very powerful in that because you want to be understood. And if you're, yeah, if you're misunderstood on a, on a, on a large level, it's painful, but you just have to be okay with it. Yeah. And it's very, very powerful. I think, again, I think that's, that's what kind of cults lure you in. You know, that's, that's part of what people use to lure you in is that, that feeling of being seen and understood. And um, mm. I think there's a, I think there's a quote from a, a George Orwell quote that uh, has something to do with, it's one thing to be loved, but to be understood um, I don't remember the quote, uh, but I wrote it down because it yeah. was compelling. But just that the, there's such power in feeling understood and feeling seen. Yeah. So it, it's probably, you know, our nature to to want that. And it's challenging when that's not happening. Um, and I think that resonated with me, too, when I listened to some of your episodes that, um, you know, you've made that point repeatedly that there's an assumption about your personality or who you are that's incorrect from who you really are. Um, so that resonated with me. Yeah. And that's probably why we connected. There's, there's uh we, we understand each other from afar. Yes. Right on. Well, I hope to meet Leon one day. He seems yeah, like a he's good man. He, he is very good. He's, uh, yeah, he's shifted over yeah. to the couch. and um, He's tired of being yeah, on camera. Um, I get it. Believe me, I know. I'm, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm working on immortalizing him in other ways. So NFTs, Leon, I'll be the first one. I want it. Thank you, bad vegan. Yeah. I think you're a good vegan. Are you still vegan? Um. The, the funny thing is, I never declared myself to be a vegan ever. Like, I never. You're not really even a vegan? The fuck I am never, I doing I mean, here? What are we doing? Just, Two hours. I never like. You're not even a vegan. You're not bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, I just was Sorry. always very. I, well, I think I knew that, like. Uh, that's a very high standard and I'm going to fuck it up. So I never right. declared myself to, I never like put myself on that pedestal because I knew I'd just get knocked off. And so, right. um, and I, I mean, I, yeah. Semi bad me, carnivore it, would not have sold on Netflix. Right. You needed bad vegan. It's the juxtaposition. I love it. I yep. love it. I look forward to your book. Thank you. And 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 keep up the meditation and, and maybe we'll end up doing mushrooms somewhere. Yeah, I think we should. Okay. I will say this to you for now. Namaste. <laughs> okay. I know I'm not a yoga person, but um, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You, all. You, you, you as well. I feel like I, I will see you soon. All right. That sounds good. Okay. Take care. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. No, it's been really fun. <laughs> now I'm going to go see Joyce Piven. Tell Joyce Piven I said, um, yeah, she's got she's got a wonderful son. Oh, and, um, thank you. Yeah. I think it's great that you guys 
do lines together. You've said that a number of times. <laughs> when it comes out. Pretty funny. <laughs> we do lines. Yes, we're gonna be we're gonna be doing yeah. some line, running some lines, doing some lines. We're gonna be running lines uh, any moment. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Right, bye. bye. How You Live in Jay Piven is a cast original podcast in association with Common Enemy. Producer is Kyle Tequila. Theme song by Common. To leave a message for Jeremy, go to speakpipe.com slash jpiven. Catch all new episodes of How You Live in Jay Piven every Wednesday on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcasts.